We're recording again. <laughs> we're gonna record in another hour. I, I think we should. I mean, if we're gonna do this, let's just you know, okay. it sucks, but we have we should just do it this we again. Get another beer. <clears throat> yeah. So Steve, explain to us what's going on here. Uh, we were recording a show about a short story, um, Orly's Tale. It's a, by a Czech writer, Klemt, von Klima. I'll take one, please, yeah. How do you say his name? I think you said it right. Ivan Klima. And this is uh, a Czech writer. He's an orderly at a hospital. And this is sometime in the 70s or 80s or so. 80s. Well, it was published in 83. It was published in 83. And recounting his experience there. So yeah, basically the story is he um, he's told by a friend of his that... So, I, you know, I don't know too much about this, but, you know, I guess... I imagine from the context of the story that in Soviet Prague, uh, if you were a writer or some sort of an artist or whatever, you would get some sort of a sinecure from the government, fellowship or like a sponsorship or something. He calls it insurance. He calls it insurance, but that's what I imagine that is. And he's convinced at the the beginning of the story by a friend that, you know, you never can be too sure about the insurance, whether or not they're just going to yank it away from you overnight or, you know... If you got, if you'll meet a worse fate, um, yeah. So he takes this job, so he's not a total leech. I guess yeah. this is the way he puts it. You know, like yeah. he's not a total. You know. Well, also, so he has a little bit of security. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't, doesn't really need the work. So but. he takes his job, and it's a contract job. He's there for a year, and there's at least once, if not a couple times, throughout the story that he, um. He says that you know he can't wait for that year to be over. Yeah, yeah. he doesn't enjoy it, um, and he can't even you know pretend he will continue there. And so he kind of meets the people he meets. He's a little, um, you know, he, he tries not to get too friendly with them overall because of that. I would say. Well, there are also people that I think he doesn't really have much connection with. So, the, I mean, there are basically four characters that we meet in the hospital. There is, that we really meet. Well, I guess the old woman, too, she's a fifth character. So, like, basically he meets the head nurse who, you know, she's constant, she opens up the story with uh, complaining to the narrator about how all these things are getting stolen from the hospital. You know, these bed sheets and, um, and window curtains and packs of glue and all kinds of things are just getting stolen left and right and uh, they're missing you know at the beginning of the story Klima is with the head nurse what are you looking for? Oh. food food? what kind uh, of food? Um, I'm fine oh. those chips are eating right? oh yeah I finished those all right. so. you can get some more I suppose you could <laughs> do you want to? I think I'm fine are you sure? yes So, yes, the head nurse. So, yeah, the story starts off with him and the head nurse counting the bed sheets. And she's like, oh, just like I suspected, you know, 100 100 bed sheets are missing. It's probably that Beeble character. And we end up getting to meet Beeble, who, as soon as, uh, so we meet him in the locker room. And Klima is just trying to take a break, you know, the narrator is taking a break in the locker room. And this guy, Beeble. He's particularly fixated on his book at the time, right? He wants to just kind of. Scurry off somewhere so we can read about Stalin. Yeah. Yeah, that's his main priority when he's on shift, is trying to find a, a corner where he's not going to bother anyone, where he could just sort of like sit down for a minute and read. Yeah, there's also this really short sentence that he gets for justification that his friend allowed him to borrow this book only for a couple of days. Yeah. yeah. So he has to read this book in the next two days, you know. So. Is that what it says? So, yeah, it's, in the beginning, his friend, like, only. A, he, you know, he mentions that my friend only lets me borrow this book for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Well, so yeah, they're counting bed sheets, and we hear about this character Beeble, who apparently just steals everything. And sure enough, 
in the locker room later on in the story, we see him take off his shirt and he's got his he's got the bed sheet that he's just stolen wrapped around his uh, torso. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, Klima, the narrator, just describes you know like his very uh, feeble's like clandestine uh, operations. You know all the shit that he brings out of his bag. Yeah, it does very meticulously. You know, packs away his pilfered belongings for the, for the day. The hospital, yeah. So yeah, the story sort of opens up with that, and we get to know... There's this other nurse there, Tanya, who ends up being a uh, more major character, who's this nurse who... Um, you know, Klima, at, at some point, he's he finds a bench to read, and he's looking at his book, and... Uh, it's across the hallway from this this hospital room where he sees this this nurse Tanya um, administering to this old woman who's dying, and there's this old man who's sitting by the old woman, uh, holding the hand of the old woman. And Klima sees this, and after a while, um, Tanya comes out of the room and joins uh, Klima, um, and you know lights up the cigarette. She takes a cigarette break, and uh, we have a conversation, right? A little conversation. Um, this is in the beginning, right? Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly. Yeah, before I managed to read a single page, Tanya emerged from the room opposite, a packet of cigarettes in her hand. Seeing the book, she asked, do you mind if I join you? She had a thick mane of black hair which she wore in a tall beehive and dark eyes whose size was accentuated by the use of eyeliner. The Lord had likewise blessed her with an ample bosom and her lips were so thick that they no longer seemed sensuous. Perhaps because these kissable lips parted to reveal brownish decayed teeth. The best descriptions of the story. And despite her ugly teeth or maybe thanks to them there was something touchingly gentle and appealing about Sister Tanya. Of course I don't mind, she said. At least I won't be bored. Or, I'm sorry, of course I don't mind, I said. At least I won't be bored. So that's his response. She says, it is a boring yeah. sort of day. And, you know, it's just a blasé sort of conversation they have. Um... No, that's her physical description, you know. That, you know, she's very, you know, in many ways she's very pretty, you know. I found her very attractive until the very last bit of the brown teeth, you know, which is the point, I guess. Actually, that makes her more attractive. That makes her more attractive. Yeah. No. Yeah, Young absolutely. Young brown teeth. There's, I don't know, there's something unique in that. You know, too many people look the same, Steve. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> too many people look the same. Yeah, like, there's but, so many typically attractive people in this fucking world. I like a few people who have who are attractive, you know, despite or perhaps because of their oddity. Well, I know? I don't wish brown teeth upon anyone. I guess. No, I don't either. But I don't only know. thing I'll say about that. I mean, like I she's I otherwise actually, very attractive. When, like, when I see an albino walking down the street, is this? I mean, I don't know if this is PC to say or anything like that. But when I see an albino walking down the street, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, my God, you're probably one of the most beautiful per- people I've seen all day, and I will probably see you all day. All right. You're so fucking unique, oh. you know. Good. I mean, that's great that you feel that way. But I don't think people would. Wish albinism on anyone, particularly. No, I know. I oh. if I ever see one, which I think is rare, I wonder if they have an umbrella or not. It's fine. Yeah, I mean, I, I I do feel for them, and I think about you know, obviously, like it must be hard for them to be you know in the sunlight as much as they are. I can only extrapolate. I don't know, but like, of course, I feel for them. But like, I also think, my God, you are a beautiful creature. Not a creature, a human being. <laughs> as long as we, we cover that part. <laughs> You're a beautiful human being. Anyway, so this creature with the, uh, the brown decayed teeth. That's one of the uh, the other characters. With the, with the blessed bosoms. The, yeah, she's blessed with bosom. Yeah. Um, Attractive, I, I mean, I, yeah. 
I get that sense for sure. She's also, you know, she's um, very unassuming. I think a lot of the other nurses, like the head, the head nurse that we meet, like her refrain that she always says is, uh, "We must keep some semblance of order in these parts," or something like that. You know, she's like this very sort of like. Well, I mean, where are some of the other nurses? There's the, um, what's her name? Is it Vera or something? Who has the face of the angel, but tells the dirtiest jokes, right? Mm. Mm. Um, he brings her up two, two or three times. No, only once, I think. No, 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 definitely in the beginning, and then she's brought up a couple more times at the end. Was she the one who makes the cocktail? Yes, as well. But yeah, this is what he's like describing after after the head nurse kind of essentially um, leaves him. He ends up in the locker room with, with Bizzle or Bizzle or whatever his name is. Beevil. Beevil. And um, just kind of watches him just steal things. He doesn't really care. And then describes like the places he goes to read or where he can reasonably read. You know, which reads are all around, around the hospital. Where he meets uh, the other orderly who... I like this character actually. Mixa. Uh, Mixa, Mixa, yeah. Mr. Mixa. Because Mixa has a very attractive life that he likes to fuck. Um, yeah. And he he shows up and drinks a beer, goes to sleep, right? Is that, that's uh-huh. what he does. Uh-huh. <laughs> he complains about having worked, uh, you know, he have been working, how long has he been working? Like, he says like 100 hours in a week or something like that. Yeah, a lot, yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, it's he's obviously pulling an exaggeration, a, but... But he's pulling a double that night, right? He's pulling like a 16-hour shift or something. Well, he I think there's also a reference somewhere in the story where it's mentioned that he's always there. I think Tanya yeah. says, like, he's always there. And, uh, and so you get this sense of this guy who just never goes home. He just, like, takes periodic rests in the locker room every now and then. But he's just always there. Yeah, you know, he talks about leaving and seeing, like, his family, but it doesn't happen. Doesn't seem to happen, and you know he drinks there. I, no, I mean he talks about home life a little, but I think he actually describes a card game he has with his wife, right? Canasta. Canasta. Yeah, he's like, but it, yeah, yeah. Describe what he actually is talking about. It's well, he notices like that some guy was having a, his hand on his wife's thigh. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But I love the way he put it. Puts it. He's like. You know, my, my, I know my wife is infidelitous, but, but like, like for example, have you ever heard of a game named Canasta? Yeah, I don't get it. I don't really understand it. But the thing was, like, we were playing and we were all having a good time. And then I looked under the table and this guy has his hand on my wife's knee. And it's like, why don't you just like, uh, I mean, I guess it's, you know, he needs some sort of like self-validation uh, of his suspicions. Yeah. Well, I mean, when he first wakes up, too, the guy's like, you know, I need someone to fuck. And he says, well, the night, the nurse on shift is unsuitable because she, she doesn't put out for anyone. Yeah. Yeah. And he thinks, like, well, the other nurses aren't around, so maybe I'll call my wife, I guess. I might as well at this point. Yeah. 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 So you think of the sense that he is the most faithful man, either. No, I don't think anyone's really faithful. So yeah, you get you get this sense of this hospital of all these sort of like comedic characters, but they're all sort of like inhabiting, a, I would say, a cynical world a little bit. Like this world where uh, no one really cares about why they're there. You know, there's, there's very little mention about like the fact that the profession of these people in the hospital is to take care of people. It's literally to take care of people. Um, you know, there's a little jogging, you know, he, he speculates that they they don't want to be associated with deaths because they keep statistics. And so if someone's going to die, they kind of shuffle around apartments hoping that someone else gets the death, you know. Oh, no, I heard. The way, I think the way that that passage was re, uh, read was that uh, they keep statistics on how many deaths a staff person has had um, on their hands. Like how many? I think that's the way it reads. I thought it was my department. I thought that at first too, but then I reread it, and uh... but it makes people prone to kind of hand off 
patients or to refuse patients or to move them somewhere else, you know, that they're obviously going to die, you know. So sick patients are, are essentially, they're treated, but in a very defat, you know, defunct manner, um, which is where the old man comes in, you know. He's kind of like this extra feature uh, in addition to all the regular, like, Visiment as people are dying, making the business of dying in the hospital. Yeah, who's the old man? Let's talk about that. Maybe. Sure, sure, sure. Is he ever named? Well, in the letter, he's called Mr. Loda. All right, yeah, that's right. We should get the. I mean, tell about the letter, like all that sort of stuff. Uh, well, he decides to write a letter um, to the nurse. The narrator does. Cleveland. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he takes the subject as this old man he saw very briefly while he was working in the hospital. And he also has seen the woman that he's with uh, had a conversation with him. And I think we overhear the conversation that, he, that she has. Um, and then he asks her a couple of questions about the guy. And then from there, he ends up writing a story about um, this man and his marriage with this woman for you know, 40 something years. It's a frame tale. In fact, the uh, the title of the story is... Well, it's an orderly's tale. An orderly's tale with a story inserted in the hat box. That's the full title. Yeah. It's a subtitle. I mean, yeah. I mean, the whole... The whole it reminds me a lot about Canterbury Tales, actually, the way it's named and everything. The yeah. framing. Yeah, kind of. Anyway. Um, but yeah, so, so we, basically we read the entire letter. That he writes to Tanya, uh, the nurse that he uh, he's taken a shine to, and is driven home. Yeah, he lies about it, which I, I always find interesting. That the reason the reason he says like, "Oh, let me let me drive you," um, which is like, why, "Why are you going out that way?" He's like, "Well, I have a friend. I'm gonna go visit." And You're making a big deal about this lying, but ultimately, I, I sort of feel like people lie. When they they don't really know people, but they want to get to know people, they they make up things, you know. I think that's what. Well, happens. I mean, she never questions him, so it's not a big deal about her. Well, her I feel like, like he feels awkward like about challenging him. Like you don't really have a friend. I don't think but she, she cares. About but she that. kind of does. I mean, like so. Ultimately, it's raining cats ask, and dogs, yeah. and she talks about how uh, she's not she's not looking for the bus ride home, and he offers to drive her home. And, but... I was actually surprised that the narrator had a car. Were you surprised by that fact? Well, this is the fifth story that I've read in the book. He's had a car all along. But there's some things that happened in cars before. But um, I'm not too surprised. Actually, in one of the other stories, he talks about how he has a car, but he doesn't like to drive it. (laughs) Um, That makes sense for the guy. No. But, um, so he offers to drive her home, but then she says, she says, oh no, it's too far. You know, I live out on the, it's like, it seems like it's probably like an hour, an hour and a half drive. Like, that's the impression I get. Because she's like, no, you know, I, I normally, you know, I'll take the bus home and it's way too out, you know. I don't know, I don't know how long. That's the it's, impression. It's a, a late. It's a long, know. long ride home. But he offers to do it. And I think to make her feel a little more easy about the situation, he's like, oh, I've got a friend out there that I've been thinking about seeing for a while. And actually, I don't know if that's a lie at that moment. He doesn't really ultimately, I don't know. It's, it becomes very clear that I was, that's just not, it's not the issue. Either. I mean, it's possible that he did have a friend out there and that he was possibly entertaining the idea, even just to sort of fool himself. Because you get in these situations like, you have this person that you're kind of interested in. You don't know where it's going to lead and whatnot. You start making up things. And like sometimes you kind of have to believe them. It's like, oh well, I actually do have a friend out there. You know, like I might as well. Or but we'll see where this goes. You know. Well, yeah, it's yes, very tentative. Yeah. Tentative at that point. I don't know if it's a malicious lie. It's not malicious. No. I just, I you just feel like he, the author is otherwise so like sober about the things he says and does, and. Does it does it make you know excuses about them? And here it's it's pretty clearly he you know he's just kind of making a little fib to to grease things along you know like whatever it is, but it, it's not unintentional. I mean I 
Because there's other times when he could very easily essentially lie again in the same manner and have a much better way off, but he doesn't. You know, he makes the decision not to. I don't think it's such a big deal. Wow. Well, right. I don't think it's really a lie. It's a, it's a foil. And, um... Well, one of my favorite moments comes, comes after he gets her out there, you know, to her place. Or it's actually her father's place. He talks, she talks briefly about her stepmother and how she's not there. And so you get the sense that she's finally alone with him. She, she and her stepmother don't get along. Yeah. She describes what she does. You know, she listens to music and reads her letters of a fiance that was like him, right? Of his age or something. Because they're they're about twenty years apart, right? In terms of age difference. Yeah. So she, you know, she. Um, what was it? She was married to this guy and she actually because they're talking about leaving Prague and she asked him have you ever been outside of the country and he's like oh I've been to America and I've been to these places and, that. and he says have you ever been outside and she says yeah briefly because I had a fiance and when they came that was the phrase I think it's like when they came we left and I think what they mean was the Soviets like that's the sense that I get when the Soviets yeah. came to, to the Czech Republic um, they left, but then she, you know, she had a father back in Prague, and so after a short while, she decided, and her fiance at the time also decided that she should go back. And now, at this point in the story, she's lost complete track of her fiance. She says she's probably. Yeah, it's never in clear what happens to him. I don't think. No, well, she but says she's probably in America. Gone. Yeah, he just kind of loses interest in her or whatever. It's over yeah. I mean he only writes her like five letters or something. Five or six but she letters. saves him so that's the thing is like you find out about this woman that you know she works all the time she works almost every day when she's not working she mostly just stays around her uh, around her house she lives with her father and her stepmother she doesn't get along with her stepmother and I think there are a couple of references where like you know she sometimes she tries to go out and like with her father and see a movie or something like that, but she rarely ever does. Um, so she just sort of stays at this house, and when her stepmother's not around, she listens to music. But when her stepmother's around, she doesn't play music, uh, and she has this collection of letters, and uh, there are letters from before, from you know her childhood, from her fiance, from different sources that she's just kept. And one of her favorite things to do in the world is to take up this box of letters and reminisce um, over these memories of, of times gone past. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what inspires Klima, the narrator, to write her a letter. Write her a letter. And he, this is his gesture. This is his way of reaching out to her. Because I think through a lot of it, like he's... It's like I kind of, I kind of like you, but I don't really want to commit, and I don't really want to. I mean, there are a couple of times, like there are a couple of times while they're sitting at her house where he thinks about kissing her, but he doesn't. Um, he says it would be so easy, you know. But like, well, I, he also very quickly realizes that he doesn't really want a relationship with her. Well, what does he want? I mean, he. You know, I don't. As an author, it seems like he he wants to not work, but beyond that, it's not clear. No, I'm saying, what does he want with her? Well, it seems at first he wants to sleep with her. I mean, that's, that's my sensibility. That he and then in the end, he decides that's not appropriate. Or he, 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 you know, he doesn't find her sexually attractive. I mean, because he describes a fantasy, right? That sexual fantasy he has with her. Well, you, the reason why. He, yeah, so the sexual fantasy is basically is this dream that he's taken into a nurse's office and she's wearing a uniform and they go behind a, a dressing screen and they fuck, fuck each other. Yeah, yeah, I used to have fantasies about making love to a nurse in a hospital. I'd be lying there as a patient. I didn't imagine any particular illness. 
But whatever it was, it was no obstacle to my amorous pursuits. The nurse had her little room on the ward, and in that room she had cupboards full of medicines, and heaven knows why, a scream. At night she would come for me, gesticulate for me to follow her, and I accompanied her to her room. There she allowed me to take off her white uniform. Then I carried her behind the screen, where there was a white doctor's couch. The rest does not require description. I have no idea why I should have chosen an anonymous nurse for my dalliance. Probably because in my mind, she combined maternal and virginal uh, virtues, mm. Mm. as befitted her mission of mercy. But all that was 20 years ago, and Tanya had left her uniform at the hospital. Not to mention, there was no screen in her room. You love that passage, though. I do, I do. Because yeah. it brings up this idea of sleeping with her, which is, you know, obviously in the car, it's very suspicious. Like, why else is, is he essentially lying to her to drive her to her place late at night just to see her? Um, and they hang out, and he, and he says, you know, yeah, I have this sexual fantasy of fucking a nurse. Like her, you know. But it turns out that she didn't bring her uniform. There's no screen. Yeah. So whatever, you know, like I'm not going to have sex with her. Um, which is funny. I find that very funny. Well, another weird thing about it is um, you don't get this in this story explicitly, but in the other stories, and if this is supposed to be taken as a collection, there is, you know, a certain through line, but it's hard to tell when the, the chronology is whatever. But like he's a married man in the other stories. And a lot of the other stories, like he has a wife. Oh, okay, interesting. Um, I don't know. This, actually, in this thinking, story, it, it really for me, got, I got the sense seemed of like single. a single man. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. Uh, so they go to Tommy's place, and he sees her box of letters, and he decides it's really for himself. I think in a lot of ways, but like he decides he's going to write her a letter. He's going to write her a letter um, that ultimately will serve as a portrait of this this character that he saw earlier in the day. This um, as he was trying to read his uh, his book, his uh, memoirs of Stalin. He um, he sees Tanya in this other room taking care of this old elderly woman who's dying. And next to the elderly woman's bed is this guy holding her hand, her husband, and this old man doesn't say anything. And so Klima basically for what is it twelve pages? What were we saying? I think he, I think it's the letter is twelve pages. pages. Yeah, I think he says a dozen pages. Well, he includes he includes the letter in the story, so we read the entire letter, and uh, he basically gives this sort of like thorough. Investigation of the the inner workings of this this old man who's just sitting by the side of his dying wife. Yeah. And the nurse responds somewhat, um, I would say, like coolly or disinterestedly in the letter. You know, she reads it, and then she kind of just talks about I guess for me like what she thinks of her as herself in this story um, it says you know I you know we try and care about the patients right mm. we do our best right so basically uh, so he writes this story it's about this old guy and, and it's it's a long I mean it's like you know, ten pages in the in the actual story. It's you know framed in the tale. Well, I found it interesting that he describes how many pages it is because he describes actually like the way he writes it and he types it out and then he. So he describes the making of this letter as well, including it, and it is substantial. It's probably like a third to a half of the word count, I would say, for what we read. Right, it's about half. It's about yeah. about half the story is the letter. It's, I mean, it's pretty thorough. I like, and it's basically about this old man who, you know, sees his wife in her last stages of life, and there's there's the shock about it. Like we were talking about that before. There's there's a, 
he he doesn't he doesn't quite realize that this is it. Like you hear about all all this sort of like lead up to the last final moments or whatever. But this is it. This is like there's no turning back. She's on her way out. Yeah, yeah. he and he reflects upon the time they spent together. You know, and he has regrets, of course, and his adultery and um, you know the things he remembers and things he can't remember. How he should have spent more time with her, essentially. How he should have spent more time with her. I still feel like he feels a little bit out of shape that he never had a child with her. Um, I think it's, he is. I a think it's brought up thing. once. You know, it's brought up. It's once. a whole paragraph, Steve. All right. All right. I mean, but yeah, I mean, like the whole letter is basically about this man who. What's up? What was that loud noise? I don't know. Brief ice. Huh? Go on. Um... Yeah, he feels like everything that he's done has always been selfish. He keeps on talking about that. How you know he's he's tried to make himself as a tailor, and it's never it never worked out for him. But like he spent long hours at the office, or like you know in meetings, or he also was trying to be a member of the community. He was always you know out with his marching band or this or that, and he reflects on how much how little time he spent with his wife. And he just kind of took her for granted. Like, he took it for granted that she would always be there to uh, to take care of him, to cook food for him. Um, and he describes one, one moment where she was actually sick. And he, he uh, took care of her. And he starts to think that he's, he thinks good about himself. Like, starts to think that, like, he's a good guy. Because here he is taking care of his sick wife. And then he reflects that, you know, she takes care of him in the same way most of the year. It's only when she's sick that he takes care of her. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, I mean, like, ultimately he comes to this realization that there's never, there's rarely been um, something that he's done for his wife that's been purely unselfish. That's not had some sort of self-interest involved. And so in the end, he decides that, the best thing that he still can do for her. Because there are a lot of things, I mean, he wants to, you know, he wants to have, like, that final conversation with her where he says, like, you know. Yeah, and she very know, briefly you know. wakes up and I think she mouths, right? She mouths something, but it's silent. Yeah, but I don't think, it doesn't seem like to me that she's fully cognizant of what's No, it seems like there. she's she's pretty clearly gone. Yeah, yeah. that's. That's the most you get out of her is like her moving her her lips and not saying anything not in the beginning, but she she's just she's dead and dying. You know, it's, it's, it's mostly with him dealing with that fact that she's a, a post. You know, like she's she's done with. You know, as a as a creature, as a being, she's she's done. And so he's responding to this fact. You know, that he's lived with for many years. And, you know, it's not always negative. Like, he, he thinks of happy times with, you know, when, they're, when they've been together. His happy Yeah, moments, primarily so. when they first met. I mean, those were the happiest moments when they first met. He describes the, the first time making love with one another. Um, but ultimately, after, it seems like after a couple of years into the marriage, there were very few happy moments after that. Maybe. I mean, they don't, they don't get into as much. But. Well, they don't. I mean, they're the only happy moments are at the beginning when he was first falling in love with her. Well, he doesn't give a full, like, detailed history of her. But what he gives it. I mean, like, he... Sure. Are, I mean, what are you... What are you claiming, then? I just, you know, that... Just because he remembers particularly, like, they're, they're young... I mean, the whole thing is about an old man remembering the times of his life, and he remembers that they were so young at one point, and they were in love with each other, but then after that, it seems like everything went to shit, and you're saying that it's just because he, he leaves some things out, and I'm like, well, what? Well, I just, even when you say it goes to shit, I think that's a, a pretty loose description, I don't... 
But I don't feel that way in particular. I mean, I think he definitely, you know, there's like the there's a, like a rocky period where he has has a an affair, right? So he, no, he has multiple affairs. Well, he has at least one, and it implies he has things. multiple affairs. It implies he's had more. I mean, if you if you want to talk about things that he doesn't mention, let's talk about the things he does mention. He has multiple affairs. <laughs> well. At least one. No, multiple. <laughs> let me let me give me a second. I'm fucking gonna look up this pop paragraph. <laughs> he was not always faithful. Keep talking. Keep talking. What we can we can cut all these things out. Dead silence. I mean, you might have something interesting to say now. No, you're, you seem very. You seem very. I'm adamant. very adamant. I yeah. am very adamant. <laughs> I, he had at least one. And he had not always been faithful to her. It happened several times, and when it did, he had least felt. He at least felt that something serious had taken place. Happened several times. Anyway, anyway, he's he's not had a very happy marriage with her. That's what I would want to say. It's like. Maybe maybe you think that like there may be moments that are like he left out or like there were parts at the beginning. I mean, he does talk about when they were falling in love, but I would say it's pretty definitive that he had, has not had a happy marriage with her. Um, but it's not been a happy marriage in that it's been they've been miserable together. It's just like it's been a very negligible marriage. Like he has neglected her, and he's coming to terms with that regret. With regret. Yeah, sure. I mean, I I, I agree that. That he's, his views neglected her, and he could spend more time with her. You know, the church I remember is when, you know, he thinks about times when he could imagine her face, and times when he just for years can't even see her. Right, you and know? the times he imagines her face is like when they had first met, and they were making love, and there was a, is it what was it, the glowing grass spreads the bounty of, of light over the across their faces. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely caught up in, like, the reverie in the beginning of their youth. <coughs> and then he spends time kind of just at her side, um, thinking what he can do. And he finally decides, right, that uh, the most unselfish thing that he could do still, because he thinks about maybe conf- he wants to confess that he cheated on her all those times but he's like now's not the right moment I can't do it right now which makes sense you know mm-hmm. and he tries to he goes through you know a couple of different things but he finally gets to this point where he's like well he's a, he's tried to be a tailor's apprentice throughout his life you know he's studied tailoring tailoring and he's like and he's made her a dress that was one of the, the best memories that he had was like making her a dress before he stitched up one of her dresses or something like that so he said, you know, the, in the final moments, the last thing that he could do for her is to tailor a dress. Because um, he goes home and he looks in the wardrobe and he sees all the dresses and he's like, she's yeah, not going to fit in these so anymore. Yeah. yeah, she's lost so much weight. She's shrunken. So he decides he's going to um, specifically tailor a dress for her to wear in these last moments. Um, and he does it. And he comes back the next day, and he has a dress in a, in a package, in a parcel. Your last thoughts um, before we close it out on uh, Ivan uh, Klima? Klima? Klima. Klima. My last thoughts? Final thoughts? You go first. Um, you go first. I actually enjoyed I enjoyed it quite a bit, and I, I, I might take the time out to read the rest of it. I think you um, should. It's been your recommendation. I, I might actually do it. Um, it's very good. And so, in that sense, I, I'm very happy to have read it.
Yeah, I'm happy too. I feel like I've gotten a little educated. Not only reading this story, but, you know, reading Klima in general. It's educated me a little bit more about, you know, what things are like in uh, Soviet Prague. But actually, I mean, like, the ho- the stories about a hospital, the, the whole environment seemed to me more like a hospice or like a, you know, death ward, you know? Like it, it well, didn't people feel like definitely a, go there to die. Yeah. yeah, but it didn't feel like a hospital. It didn't feel like a hospital in full functioning sense of a hospital. It seemed more of a place where, like, they don't have enough supplies because everyone keeps on... St- Dealing shit and like selling it on the black market, or you know, well, that's the you have these nurses that are like uh, unofficially euthanizing the patients because they don't want to deal with them, or you know, you have these. I don't know. It just it seemed like a yeah, yeah, a meat grinder for sure. I mean, I personally lay that down on the socialist economy. But. Oh yeah, certainly, absolutely. But that's what I'm saying with. The story is um, very edifying to me, as much as you know the whole experience of reading Ivan Klima has been, because it's you know broadened my perspective about what the real the real absurdity and the real ineptitude of life in Soviet Prague, which I had never really thought about much. I mean, we didn't really get into this this recording, the the lost recording we got a little into this, but like. <laughs> I feel like this story is about impotence. I feel like it's about characters, these personalities who have these desires for, you know, human connection in some way or another, but they can't find it for whatever reason. They don't know how to affect it, or they don't can't find a, a good time to affect it. Um, it's just like all of these characters have these fervent desires for being connected with one another but no one is able to figure out how to do that Um, yeah Yeah. but we didn't get into too much letter about the letter this time the character of Mr. Lota why I find it interesting the, the distinction between him writing and then him describing a letter he's written, which is, you know, as far as we can tell, the letter he actually wrote. Yeah. And so there's, there's like a distinction between the people he's meeting and the people he imagines the letter, you know, that are then filtered through through that letter. Yeah. But, you know, I feel like the real, the real heart of the the story is is the remembrances you know that he misses of the old man you know that's the that's the real story right I mean, it's a <laughs> you place so much importance on those happy halcyon moments but yeah, yeah of course I don't think it's the most precedence in the story that, that that compels you to feel that way I feel like it's, that's why he's writing the story he's writing the story for those those moments no I don't think he is no <laughs> those moments, those moments when they like almost go to see a movie together, but don't. Well, he's regretful, you know. He's, 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 I mean, what moments are you talking about? I mean, the, the story is fucking bleak. It's absurd and it's bleak. It's funny, but it's bleak. It's not. There, it's there not, are moments that are uplifting, though. There, there are moments that there was that very little been. about the story that was uplifting, dude. There were moments that were entertaining, and there were moments that were tender. And there was a lot of tenderness in the story. But I wouldn't say that any of it was uplifting. Well, maybe not this is like an inspiration of the whole... I mean, uh, the hospital can't function as a hospital because they don't have enough supplies, or they don't have, like, you know, staff members who actually care, you know? And the writer can't function as a writer because apparently his insurance might give way. So that's why he's even in this hospital in the first place. And when he when he entertains this sort of like, you know, dalliance with Tanya, like he can't ultimately act upon it. He wants to kiss her. He wants to impact her, but he can't. And he knows he can't. He's not part of her world. 
And, you know, he wants sort of a recognition for being a part of this world, but he's not, you know, and she doesn't give him recognition. The whole story is about these fervent desires to be something other than what you are and what it is. And in the story of Mr. Loto, like, he wanted to be a good husband. No, it's not actually that he wanted to be a good husband. He wanted to, he wanted to have a good life uh, with this woman that he truly loves. And he couldn't. I mean, he has a couple of very isolated, shining moments. A couple of very, like, isolated moments where he has fond memories of things that they had done way back in their youth. But as an old man now, he looks back on their marriage and he realizes that most of the time, he spent with his wife. He hasn't really spent with her. He spent off at like meetings, or he spent like fucking marching with the, the marching band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. playing football, drumming. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, he again. I don't think it's as bleak. It you is. Really, as bleak. you really paint a, a dark picture. Here. It's a dark fucking story. It's not always a. Where is the hope? Where is the final hope in the story? I don't hope in the story. I mean, he's alive. The, the the woman he gives it to is alive. She, she, <laughs> Wait, they're alive. That's yeah. the hope. I are you kidding me, Steve? Like that? That's like a final, like great redeeming. Like that's what makes this story cheery. Is it? They're alive. Thank God, they're alive. Because they all could be dead, and that would suck. But thank God, they're alive. Well, it's not the bare minimum. No, it's like, not. It's an extraordinary, it's an amazing quantity like that to be alive. In that yeah. sense, too. Like, I mean, take this this man's wife, um, the old man's wife. Like, who is she? Like, who who do we know about her? Like, what what can we really say about this woman with confidence? Nothing. <laughs> very little. Well, I feel like a few things. It's not quite nothing, but a few very things. Very little, very little. Yeah. Like, who knew this woman? Like, her husband apparently not very well. I mean, the way you put it. Yeah, he doesn't know her very well. Although, you know, he knows that... What, well, that she, um... She's always wanted to have a child. She's very... It doesn't really describe much about her. It's mostly about it. Yeah, yeah. She's the one dead, you know, dying. <laughs> you, get, you get little, you know. No, no one gets that, right? <laughs> Even the husband. I'm trying to imagine. Who was this one I was married to for 40 years? Yeah. can hardly remember her. Her you know? face. He, he, like, yeah. there are times where he forgot her face. That's my, you know, that's always my favorite details. Like, yeah. Yeah, this whole time I just don't even remember. <laughs> it's awful, right? It's so awful. I don't know why you think they're redeeming elements. I mean, it's a great story. Don't get me wrong, but it's a dark fucking story. I mean, like in terms of the content, there's very little hope. The fact that they're alive, I, I feel like, would be a bare minimum for a story like this. I mean, it would suck if there was just like one character who was describing a bunch but, of dead people. That would suck. That would really suck. So yeah, yes, you're right. Yeah, that. it's it's a little cheerier than just that. But yeah. <laughs> exempting that it's, scenario, it's much cheerier. Though, I don't like, it, exempting that scenario. I don't. I can't imagine something that would be darker than this story. It's, it's much cheerier than that though, because he he's alive. You know. Um, the nurses are alive. He, he even wrote like a fictional story about some old man who's next to a dead woman. He's writing. Yeah. Which also, I just want to get the sense, and the more, if you read more of these stories, and I hope you do, they're, they're awesome. Um, you get the sense of like, he doesn't really care about, like, he recognizes that, that life in Soviet Prague as an intellectual is, is it's an absurd life. And it's an incomprehensible life. And it's just like the weirdest shit happens to you. But he takes a very casual outlook on it. And I think throughout the entire book, like, his whole attitude is like, 
well, as long as I still get to write, you know, because that's really all that I want to do. And if I can figure out a way to write despite all this, you know, then I'm cool. Yeah, no, I mean, he, he definitely has that attitude, I, I think. Um, Which he does, I mean. He treasures it and he desires it and he wants to do it. And he even, he even based on a rumor, takes a part-time job to, to avoid, you know, capture, as it were. <laughs> However that goes. And he, he has some heart, you know, like he has some, some desire to help people that he's with. The amount is dubious, you know. I, the what? How much he really cares about people, I think. It's, yeah. it's just, you know, I'm, I'm suspicious. Like the episode where he, an old woman offers to pay him, right? Offers to pay him ten, ten dollars or whatever it is. Um, just stay with her and see her again. And he refuses. And he refuses in the sense that if he had taken the money, he would have felt obligated to go. And he congratulates himself on this thing because everyone else would have taken the money and not gone. But he refuses to take the money at all and not go. And so that exempts him, you know, from her plight and her debt. I don't know about that. I mean, like, I think he is trying to be nice by not taking the money. I mean, it's... In a way, at the beginning, I think it, it seems like an act of humility. It's like, no, I don't, you don't need to pay me. I don't know. It, se- it seems like he's actually out of humility. I think it's only as an afterthought where it's like, well, I'm glad I didn't take your money because if I had, I would have felt really lousy about not showing up to her room right before she died. You know? I think that's well, it's, I mean, it's interesting to be paid to show up upon someone's death. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and he's he's very entertained by the thief. Like, you know, he doesn't have a strong moral character in a lot of ways. I mean, like, he has his own judgment, maybe, but, like, he sees this guy just, like, you know... Oh, yeah, just robbing. Unashamedly, just, like, robbing all kinds of shit from the hospital. He knows that the hospital is in dire straits in terms of supplies and whatnot. And he just seems kind of, like, mildly entertained by it. There's this guy who just, like, starts pulling up beers and, like, you know, talking about how he'd like to fuck all the nurses and, like, he's just kind of, like, mildly entertained by it. Yeah, no, it's, um... Yeah, it's interesting that he goes straight from one to the other where there's one character who's complaining about it and the other character that's doing it. Um, you know, I got the sense that he, he wanted to be able to just say, like, yeah, I, I spent time with this guy and I don't care. I, I just don't care that this guy's stealing things. Yeah. You know. I don't know. I mean, I guess... It's a very defeatist attitude about this story. Well, I, it's not clear if it's, if it's just like he wants to be able to witness it or if he just... It's like he... The sense I get is like he encounters it, right? It happens as he exists. And he's... He's like, well, that's that's the way it is currently. And I I have nothing to say upon it. You know, like I it's, it's current, that's that's it. That's what it is. Um, and this is more like an accidental quality to his existence. That he's witnessing it. Um, but there's no moral judgment. Yeah. For himself, you know, he does take some some sense of the what he ought to do, what he uh, obligated to do. He discusses it briefly, like, I'm paid, I'm not paid to be nice, but I am nice. He congratulates himself in that sense. You know, and I do nice things to prefer people. You know. Yeah. I just think, you know, you definitely see it in the story. Uh, he's just uh, he recognizes that the whole fucking scenario the whole scenario this hospital in Prague 
in the Czech Republic, in the entire Soviet Union. You know, like, shit's absurd. It's real fucking absurd. I mean, he talks about in other stories how, like, he has these people who are like, you know, only ten years ago they were the most highly esteemed intellectuals in academia and whatnot, and now they're, you know, they're basically like entry-level positions in laundromats, you know? It's like, that's the, what we've come to, you know? It's a real absurdity about the conditions that he describes, you know? But, you know, his general take of it is like, well... This is all, all that I want to do in life is write. And all that I need to write is, you know, a little bit of a corner where I can sort of like have a retreat and material. Mm -hmm. And I think he looks at all of the, all of this experience as an orderly in the hospital and whatnot as merely material. Yeah. Although I, I think he's invested, but I don't know. It's a question of how much he's invested, I suppose. Yeah. Or it's reminding me of an anime right now, um, Yankin or something. But mm -hmm. I just it's reminding me of something on on series today. All right, um, are we done? I think I think that's it. Right? Okay. Let's uh, let's round it off. I I'm signing off. Right. Adam, I'm signing off. Right. Poetry, wine, and virtue. Bam, bam, bam. 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 The, it's you decide. You decide. <laughs> call yep. us back. Call us back. We'll make you comment or whatever. Wherever the... Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs>